Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Fareed Riaz, uh, and welcome to tonight's SIR Resident Fellow and Student Section webinar. Um, as you all probably know, we hold these sessions about every two weeks or so, so thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, as we're going to go through this presentation, if you have any questions, um, feel free to either type them into the questions box or the chat box. Um, Rajat, um, who I'll be introducing in a second, will uh, field those questions. Um, and if you want to watch this seminar at a later date or know someone else who does, um, after this is finished, I will uh, be editing the video and uploading it to our YouTube account so you can watch it then. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Rajat Chand, who will be introducing our speaker for tonight. Hey, everybody. Thanks uh, so much for joining us here tonight. Um, uh, my name is Rajat. I'm a part of the RFS Clinical Education Committee, and as part of our as a part of our research lecture series, we have a real treat tonight um, having Dr. Ziv Haskell uh, giving a lecture for us. He's the editor in chief of the Journal of Vascular and Interventional Radiology, and tonight he's going to be uh, kind of giving us some pointers on how to get our uh, potential papers published in a radiologic journal, uh, one that's peer reviewed and with a high impact factor, um, amongst other things, he'll be discussing his recent publication um, entitled Impact is Everything. It's an editor's message. He'll, he'll try to educate us on some of the future perspectives of his journal. And, um, you know, Dr. Haskell has a, has a really, um, is really well distinguished in the, com in the community of interventional radiology. But just to tell you a little bit about him, he's a tenured professor of radiology and medical imaging in interventional radiology division at the University of Virginia Medical School. Uh, he got his MD at Boston University and then completed his residency and fellowship at uh, University of California, San Francisco. He's a really sought after teacher and educator. He's given more than 500 invited lectures worldwide, has been awarded numerous honorary fellowships, national, international, and societal awards for leadership, service, and research excellence. Uh, last year, he was award the awardee of the prestigious Leaders and in Innovation Award of the Society of Interventional Radiology Research Foundation. Uh, he has designed, participated, and led over 40 research trials. Uh, he has published over 400 scientific manuscripts, chapters, reviews, abstracts, and editorials in journals ranging from human gene therapy to the New England Journal and Circulation, JVIR, Radiology, Hepatology, and many, many others. Uh, actually, the AHA guidelines documented that he co-chaired and co-wrote um, has been cited in o has been cited over 2,700 times. Uh, he co-founded the world's largest scientific congress on embolization, GEST, and led the societal uh, Society of Interventional Radiology's SIR annual scientific meeting as well. Uh, his published research has spanned many topics, including oncology, portal hypertension, venous disease, liver transplantation, peripheral vascular disease, uterine fibroid embolization, interventional oncology human gene therapy, uh, hemodialysis, and hemodialysis-related matters. He has actually been the editor-in-chief of two peer-reviewed journals, one uh, JVIR and one gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal inter intervention. Uh, as editor of JVIR since 2011, he has doubled its manuscript submissions, he's raised the impact factor, and he's introduced numerous print, electronic, and new media offerings. He serves in many societal leadership and committee positions, amongst them the SIR's executive board, Board of Trustees, and Research Foundation Board. He's chaired or served in numerous national committees, including within the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the American College of Radiology. He has served as a president of two societies, the International Society of Neurovascular Disease uh, from 2014 to 2015, and the Society of Gastrointestinal Vent Intervention from 2014 and currently. He has been near continuously named to national top doctors list since 1996, and it is our real honor to introduce him tonight and have him lead this discussion on publishing in a peer-reviewed radiologic journal. We really do hope that you all take away um, the many key points from this uh, discussion tonight, and if you have any questions along the way, please do pose them in the chat section. I'll be moderating this session, and I'll be posing them to Dr. Haskell as they come, and at the end as well, we'll have a Q&A session to discuss some of the more questions that come up along the way. Again, as Fareed mentioned earlier, this whole session will be recorded. It'll be available on YouTube. If you go on YouTube and type in IR Education, it'll be there as a recorded lecture. You can access it at any time. 
And without any further ado, Dr. Haskell, I'll let you take the floor here and uh, start your discussion. Rosette, thank you so much for the extraordinary uh, invite and my real and sincere congratulations to all of you for this momentous and sustained effort for education. You've really assembled an extraordinary uh, body of work. So uh, i give you a little bit of background. I had no intent on being in academia. I never really liked to write. Uh, I wrote a little bit in residency and fellowship and I took an academic job because I figured I'd be there for a couple of years and then find a private practice job. I moved from the east, from the west back to the east. So I guess the point of saying that is having mentored a lot of people and a lot of trainees since is that nobody really knows what they can or they can't. And those who think they can't write or don't know how to write are potentially as wrong as those who automatically say, I definitely want to do research and may never do so. The point is that you've got to do it to find out if you can. And the writing aspect, which is what we'll talk about tonight, is really a skill. It's nothing that you're born with. It can be perfected and it's essential to perfect it if you want to be able to advance your research and advance in academia as well. So as a journal editor, again, something I never quite imagined I'd find myself doing, uh, by sheer numbers of looking at papers, you get a lot of experience in just thinking about writing and communications. And I'd like to share at least a few things. To many of you, some of these will be obvious, but I assure you that the ones that are obvious to you are not the ones that are necessarily obvious to anyone else. So I'll cover a lot of stuff, and I truly, as Rajat said, encourage anyone to ask questions along the way, and we'll try to feel them as we go along to make it a little bit more interactive for everybody as well. So for lack of a better title, from the editor, how to get your paper published. So, some important messages. They seem obvious, but what's the point? The point is to make sure that what you're trying to publish adds to existing knowledge. Either it expands it, it replicates it, or it's new information, and that it has merit. So. A point that I'll repeat again, just to submit a paper that says to report my experience and to report my three-year experience, my 15-year experience alone, why is your experience interesting to anyone else? So getting a paper published means that you have to get it through the review process, which means to convince the editors and the reviewers that it is of interest and will have merit, and at the same time, not just get it through them, but have it be of interest and be cited and have impact. So be honest and understand what does this really add. So let's take it from the other side. Why do papers get rejected? Haven't explained why the paper is important. Now not every paper has to be written that way. You'll see plenty of journals that don't read their papers or write their papers this way, but as you look at the larger and most important journals, there are some consistencies to them, which is explaining some of the background and then explaining what's missing and then tell them what you're going to do. So I kind of think of an introduction, and I usually write it as the last thing, as an inverted pyramid. Start with a broad a series of broad statements, narrow it to what's missing, and then widen it out almost like uh, perhaps a, 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 then a, a smaller pyramid at the bottom, broadening out to now what you're going to do to address that. Now the width of that uh, pyramid at the top does not have to be an all-encompassing review. For example, we publish now about 40% of recent issues have been about oncology. And if every single hepatocellular carcinoma paper opened with a sentence that 95% of authors want to give it, then every paper would start with HCC is the sixth, so the fifth most common tumor in the world, and then go on from there. And you would see that sentence in every single paper. And it's the first thing I cut. We all know that. So start at a level below that and explain what's missing in yours in area of specific research. Make it easy for the reviewers to understand. Inconsistent or inaccurate data or an outdated review of literature. There's nothing more embarrassing than having stopped your literature one, two, or four years before the, the current research or having missed key papers in the journal to which you're submitting. Now it seems obvious, but how does it happen? Papers get rejected from one journal and then they get resubmitted to another one. And 
in the time it takes to do that, authors simply resubmit it to the next one. They haven't updated it to the new journal format. Sometimes they even leave the cover letter from the original journal on it. And the literature may have changed by one to two or three key papers. So it's important to make sure that you're up to date. Errors in your tables, numbers that don't match up, things like that, those are clues that raise real questions about the integrity of the science and those can be hard ones to overcome. So it's important to review, view, and review all of those things. Other reasons why manuscripts uh, get the bump is uh, trying to oversell the results, trying to squeeze more out of the data than uh, is really there, over-interpreting, trying to read significance in results where the sample sizes may be so small so that even though you got a p-value, one or two additional patients might rock the boat or seesaw it in the other direction. Methods of testing has to do with statistics as well. So there's a lot more to statistics than just running uh, paired or unpaired t-tests. So use, taking advantage of uh, local statistical help is essential. Uh, not recognizing the biases in the paper. One natural example of uh, potential biases uh, is an oncology paper in which we're looking at tumor response to a therapy and the typical sentence is written is typically follow-up imaging uh, is done or was done at 1, 3, 6, 9, 10, 12 months. What we're not actually told is whether those patients, how many of them got those imaging. So you can readily imagine that if 50 percent of the patients missed imaging at six months and it looked pretty good at three and then they had a recurrence at 12 then you're uh, describing it as a one-year recurrence not a six-month recurrence it might have been there at six so describing and recognizing the biases in the data collection or at least being candid about it the last thing which is the text is difficult to follow will come up on that some more in some of the other slides in terms of writing style so Assuming you have a good idea, there are some basic and simple things that you can do to improve the likelihood that your paper is going to move ahead. And many of them are really simple, but I can tell you that this stuff doesn't happen. And it has nothing to do with either being a foreign author or a junior author or anything like that. This, these kinds of things come up with the most senior and incredibly well-published authors and uh, people that you'd know and recognize. So at least some things that grab me. Make your title catchy, but not a giant word salad of four lines of text, or even three lines of text. You'll see by looking at journals that they don't have room or for titles that long, or they don't favor them. Now, let's look at your target journal. Make sure that your title actually explains what's in the paper. It's a headline. Headlines gotta grab the review process and the reviewers, but equally, people who are going to PubMed search your paper later. Make sure your title tells them what's in the paper, not just a review of GI bleeding embolization. A thousand papers on that. This is uh, glue embolization of lower gastrointestinal hemorrhage. All right, that's something different. In the introduction, make sure that you've got something important to say and make it clear. So, again, to emphasize, explain to the reviewers, because that's going to be the same question that a reader is going to have, which is, why is this interesting to me? How is it going to change my practice either as a building block to new research or as something that I need to do differently for patients uh, or for animals or whatever you're testing or designing or, or uh, inventing? But don't assume that the reviewers and also the readers can figure out what's new about your paper and why it's unique. Tell them. So some of the things that I like about abstracts are not necessarily true of all journals, but I can tell you that these are good rules of thumb for virtually any journal. Uh, make the abstracts as specific as possible. Kill almost all the background info. You're writing to an educated audience. Most of uh, How do people see your papers? Well, they're browsing the paper journal and a tremendous number of our readers still read on paper or 
they're doing an internet search, which means they're going to see your abstract and decide whether to download a full article, possibly even have to pay to do it, or download it to include in uh, a subsequent paper or research that they're doing, which means cite it. So the abstract is, like the title, an advertisement. As much possible detail as can be there. Have them understand what really happened in the paper in detail rather than a lot about methods and very, very little results or a lot about background or a lot of editorial. This may be the only thing that somebody will see in trying to decide whether to pull down your paper on the internet. And not everybody has easy institutional subscriptions that say they can get anything they want. So it really makes a difference. Some of these points are repeated for emphasis. Use the intro to explain why you're doing the study. What don't we know about chemoembolization using oil in HCC, or what do we know, or what would we like to know better, and how am I going to answer it in this paper, or what did this undertake to do? Replicating prior work in equal or better detail is not a problem. There's no problem with having 23 randomized trials comparing tips to endoscopic therapies for different types of variceal bleeding. They all have relevance. They're all actually very different populations. And they all get rolled into systematic or meta-analyses. So having more data that uh, reflects uh, differences or whether or not those first always promising results that the first trial does actually hold up uh, is always uh, worthwhile. That's fine. Not a problem with replication, but explain to people what you're trying to do. Prove that something still holds. Make sure that you know your literature better than the reviewers because it's an, embar it's an embarrassment to the authors to have the reviewers, especially in that home journal to which you're submitting, tell you that there are bigger, equal, or more important papers. And when citing some of the prior literature, don't fall into the easy uh, way of minimally citing prior papers by saying other authors have described uh, similar things and then simply having a citation. I'll certainly look at those papers if I don't do my own research on the subject and I may find that it's an equal size or it's a better paper or it may be a much larger cohort and my first question is, is maybe they didn't read those papers or they thought they're sneaking something by. Not a good start. So uh, be honest and mention what's in the prior one. It provides you the platform to say what's similar or different in yours. And then ideally, at least for me, I like to see an intro close with a real short sentence, the hypothesis, the thing that's going to happen. Tell them what you're going to tell them. <coughs> so moving into the methods section. <coughs> Excuse me. The methods, and mostly the results, should be in past tense because they describe what actually happened, not what is happening. So if someone's writing in, in present tense, it means that they may not have gone back and verified in a clinical paper that everything that they said actually happened, rather than saying, this is what we generally do. So consistent past tense and consistent description of what occurred. Figure out for a clinical study whether the journal prefers its demographics <coughs> in the M&M section or in the results section. Many journals, certainly JVIR, one of them, prefer the demographics in the M&M section. I do. The patients are the materials, the treatments are, are the methods as well, and then the results of those treatments are the results section. So uh, the baseline data goes in the methods. No need to mention a lot of basic stuff. For interventional procedure reports when describing results of a cohort, prospective or retrospective, the methods don't need to read like a dictation note. There's no reason to say, sterile, prepped, and draped, 
Seldiger technique was used to puncture the right common femoral artery, a guide wire is threaded through the needle, a sheath was followed, all that stuff. Dull, boring, no reader wants to see it. I can tell you that it's not my perspective alone on that, but one of the things I did in starting in, in uh, taking over JVR is shorten every paper dramatically. Now we're still longer than some other uh, top journals, but still, I get a lot of feedback from readers, we seek it, who say the articles are shorter, they're easier, they're to the point. <coughs> Make sure that you've got the uh, IRB or the animal approval available starting the paper in either exemption because your institution didn't require it or you have IRB approval. So as a larger issue, uh, all of us should be focusing on prospective research. We want our research to be taken as seriously as other specialties with a long established tradition of prospective research and that means that we should be engaging in the more difficult work of prospective research and trials rather than the classic radiology work which is let's retrospectively look at the last 50 that we did, get an IRB approval, look backwards because the results are always different in retrospect. So it's a lot more upfront work, but I can assure you that your research will be cited better, you'll be respected more for doing that front end work. Well, what about the results? The results should follow the natural temporal order of the studies. In other words, start with the acute points and rather than starting with the long-term results and then going into technical points and then jumping back to complications and then going into midterm study findings as well. Follow a natural temporal order and that order is often dictated by the methods. It's possible to sketch out a methods for a paper before even having the data done. If you're reporting a retrospective study on X, you can probably slot out X number of patients over this time with gender this, with mean and range of that, who underwent the following with the following criteria. You can essentially sort of sketch out the skeleton, which becomes easier with time, and then fill in the data as it goes. And certainly I remember my first papers and this kind of uh, tyranny of staring at a blank page trying to write the first line of a review for nearly an entire weekend until I called a friend of mine who had been an intern with me who had written 23 papers at the time of his internship and he started to dictate a paper on the phone. He knew nothing about radiology or AIDS related lymphoma which is what I was writing on. He was an ophthalmologist and yet he could sort of show me the skeleton underneath. This is the same. Once you learn that, especially if you're early on, then you can start working on pieces that are basically mechanical. Start with the methods, start with the results, leave the intro and the discussion for later. So results basically highlight things, provide your statistical analysis, spend as much time in the methods describing your statistics as you see fit. Papers will have limits on the amount that you can write, but there's almost always the ability to add online information without limits. So if your statistics are detailed and extensive, they'll either get included in the print version or they'll be included in the supplemental version. But either way, don't scrimp on that because that's what people are going to extract later on, including your paper and larger reviews. What about using references correctly? References, to me at least, are a clue as to someone is methodical. And if they're not methodical, then questions about all the research come uh, to the front. So a few general points about using citations. Make sure that they actually fit. Having a citation that doesn't match the sentence or the paper doesn't actually contain the information that's included is clearly a clue that the authors probably just used the abstract. They didn't actually read the papers. Or citing foreign papers in a language that the authors probably don't know is equally a clue that they read the abstract but they didn't read the papers. And that's a problem because that raises, that's a red flag for everything. So support all the remarks. Don't assume that facts are true. 
use primary citations. Don't cite review articles, but go back to the source article. Go back to the beginning. You'll find, certainly I do, when I read review articles, that there are a lot of sentences that keep being repeated again and again and again. You go back to the source article. It ain't true. So in writing a paper, you become the expert, at least for that window of time, on your subject. Use the opportunity to go all the way back, look under a few rocks. You might be surprised. Makes your paper more interesting. So uh, I certainly spot check some references to make sure that... Uh, everything makes sense and uh, the references are appropriately used and if I don't find them to match up then it's kind of a black mark against the paper they've got to go back and convince the editors that everything makes sense some general points this is a JVR preference it's not true of every journal uh, I tend to try to avoid statements of primacy all of us think that by saying this is the first ever that it's going to make the paper jump out to the front because of that, or to our knowledge, there's almost always somebody who crawls out from under a rock who reminds you that they actually had a paper that uh, reported something before you that you missed. It's just not necessary. The paper and the research will stand on its own. They don't sustain very long as soon as somebody repeats it. So it's easy enough to simply remove it and sometimes they border on the ridiculous and I give you an example of one that was actually in a paper this is the first description of a transcatheter preoperative embolization of a left patellar angiosarcoma in a 41 year old commercial fisherman I mean that's full of primacy right it's a fisherman it's a commercial fisherman it's the left it's not the right patella you know all of these things so it's just silly easy enough to write it without it Back to some things I mentioned at the beginning. Shaping the paper. No need to tell people that the purpose of your paper is to report your experience. What makes your experience special? Instead, tell them what is special about the actual experience rather than just your experience. It's the same thing about papers that say a 10-year uh, uh, a, a experience in X. Well, if somebody has a five-year experience with four times the patients, why is a 10-year experience with 25% of the patients more interesting? It's not necessarily. So equally, consider what the message and uh, the title and the purpose actually tell people. And I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about limitations. You'll see that in every JVR paper that, uh, that I accept that the second to last paragraph is typically a statement of limitations and almost all of these go back to authors with the request for more detail certainly the first time around that they're submitting either an author doesn't include one or they write the standard one which is this paper includes the limitations shared by all retrospective series something like that on the other hand our paper has the following strengths that's not a limitations paragraph. That's pretending that you don't have some or not having insight into the data or being afraid that stating limitations might lead to rejection of a paper. That's not true. Stating the limitations means that you understand how far your science has gone. You're providing a signpost to the next paper and to the next research by indicating what work needs to be done. You're teaching other people. That's honest. Uh, I'm sure many of our listeners have or go to journal clubs. What is a journal club? It's, it's, it's club as a verb, right? We go there and we club the papers that we're discussing to death. We spend our time explaining why these papers are just terrible and they're full of errors and uh, on the assumption that we would simply do it better. Well, it's kind of a silly exercise to do that but why not simply describe the limitations of the paper in the paper and be upfront and candid about it. And I'll tell you that when I go to journal clubs where that's done uh, that's the first thing that readers do. They go to the limitations paragraph and they build from that. It's useful. Here's an obviously obvious looking tip which is follow the instructions of the journal wherever you're submitting. It means the type, possibly the length, the format, the content, 
Look at examples published in that paper. If the journal says that you have 900 words for your text and your four references for a letter to the editor, then why send it to the journal as I received today 1260 words with eight references and call it a letter to the editor? It's just unnecessary. Why send a paper that has 31 images when 15 are allowed? Well, some people think, well, the editor will tell us which one he or she likes and we'll cut out the rest. No, that's not our job. Your job is to submit it within the format. And having it sent back is a problem. May demote it. So, just some examples from JVR. This holds for all journals. It is striking how virtually every single day that I see papers, and I see papers six or seven days a week, that authors ignore them. Or they're clearly resubmitting a paper that was rejected elsewhere, and they've been too lazy to revise it into JVR's format. We have no problem whatsoever receiving a paper that was rejected elsewhere because the same goes with JVR papers. Every year I run an analysis to see what happened to papers I rejected, see how I did. It's not a problem. Every paper has a home somewhere, but you've got to make it fit the journal that you're submitting to. We can always tell when somebody hasn't done the work. So just some examples from JVIR, and these get modified every so often, but you'll see that there are general types of categories for types of reports work within them. If you really have something that's very, very different, you can write the publication office and ask them, what do you guys think about this? Can you give me some suggestions or otherwise. Most journals are happy to have some interaction at some level with an author beforehand. Or I'd hope they do. We're here to publish authors' research. We are in service of authors, which means we care about authors. I do. So even things like as double-spaced page numbers. We beg people to include page numbers and mandate it. Think how difficult it is to review a paper when there are no page numbers on the document you're trying to say on page 7, line 26, the following thing. And there is no line number and there is no page number because the instructions were ignored. So make it simple for people to review your paper and take a positive light or not be distracted by structural aspects so they can read your science. How to communicate with a journal. This is actual communication. I have a cover letter that's mandatory to include something. Don't have to write a lot, but it's basically a place for an author to say something to the editor directly, like, I think my paper is great because, or this is what I want to do with this, or here's why it's interesting, etc., etc. Words that aren't easily or as casually written inside of a paper. So we got a letter last February, Dear Doctor So-and-so, your submission and title has been received by JBIR. However, before we can proceed, we ask you to address the following. Please include a cover letter addressing the editors. So that was sent back by the Publication Coordinator Office, who worked for JBIR. And this is what the JBIR, what we get back from the author. Quote, this is the annoying, kind of annoying BS that makes authors send papers elsewhere. New submissions do not need a cover letter stating the obvious suggests the process be examined, re-examined. You tell me how that really helps to write that, okay? I mean, if you want to be the journal editor, have at it. But this does not necessarily endear or move that process ahead. I'll tell you that this is an extremely senior author with a fair number of publications. I'm not sure how that really helps. I do care about authors, but we ask the same things of everybody, and these things are intended to be convenience and move them to success. So. Why does this really come up? Because I'm sure none of you writing or listening tonight are ever going to do something like this, but sometimes you get annoyed when you get a review back because that was your baby. You spent months on it, send it in, and you get sometimes some harsh comments, and you kind of want to lash out and say that, you know, that reviewer was just nuts, doesn't know what he or she are talking about. It's not fruitful. There are better ways to express it, and we'll come to that in just a moment. So just to further emphasize, following directions. We have examples of types of sentences, even style points as a starting point for people, but planning your study, 
and looking at directions, like reporting standards. What's a reporting standard? It's essentially a ruler. And using the same ruler for measuring things in a certain area of science allows people to compare one set of measurements to another. So if you're using the dialysis reporting standards for technical success and hemodynamic success in yours, and someone else is using them, then you know that your data, how your data compares to theirs, and you both stand a chance of being included in a systematic analysis. But if everybody has different definitions, then who the heck knows? So take a look at those and adhere to that journal's standards or the national standards. Same for complications, be they CTCAE or SIR standards or otherwise. It enhances the value of your paper over time. Makes it potentially more durable. So there are lots of reporting standards and QI documents and JVIR and other societies have them as well. Make sure that you're using the most important ones. They don't just have to be that journals. What about language? Seems silly to say that language is important. But it's important at the first pass. Publishers and editors don't correct your work. There is sometimes a perception that I'll write it, and if they like it, I'll either get it fixed or they'll tell me how to fix it. That doesn't fly. We don't correct language. We'd like it to read consistently. I want all the papers in JVR to have a very consistent, short style, succinct, minimized passive voice, easy to read, neutral scientific voicing, no casual phrases, uh, even things like patient was on antibiotics. On is what's on a table. Cup is on the table. Uh, so, got to be clean going in. Short direct sentences. One fact per sentence. Not long run on sentences. Get the verb tense consistent. Don't jump back and forth between different tenses in a section and make sure that it's the right tense, which for the most part is often past tense for a lot of it. What the methods were and the results is past. Present tense is current known facts, hypotheses, and discussion. Pretty simple. Active voice really makes a paper easier to read. Shorter sentences. Avoid the word salad. Avoid creating new abbreviations that seem cool, that aren't part of the journal, that simply make a paper hard to read. Skip the unnecessary adverbs. Very significant. Or a sentence that says, uh, repeat CT scan showed no significant abnormalities in the spleen, parentheses, no infarction, close parentheses. Why not just write, repeat CT scan showed no splenic infarction? Or showed few scattered X, parentheses, seven. No, showed seven of X. Shorter sentences, reduce redundancy, make sure the words make sense. So, why make your paper easy to read? Because the reviewers and the editors are human beings. Reviewers not necessarily seeing a lot of papers may have a visceral response to a difficult to read paper and mistakenly believe that the science is bad because the English is poor. And this has nothing to do with writing in a foreign language. We just mean poor expression. They may mistakenly assume that the errors have to do with the science rather than perhaps inexperience in writing. Aim for accurate, concise, clear, objective representation and sentences. So it is definitely harder for people to write in a second language, but it has nothing to do with that alone. I can tell you that we as Americans write pretty poorly as well, and it has nothing to do with seniority. We have many senior authors, including some world-renowned authors whose names you'll know, who simply can't write sentences. 
and they just go back and forth and back and forth with us. So this really means this is a skill and it's just practice and your dedication and mastering it can be done but it's essential to do it. If you're writing from another language, consider professional language editing up front. If you're writing your early papers, get somebody senior who's published to look at your paper and make heavy corrections. I'll certainly remember the first major paper that I wrote during fellowship in which I submitted a draft of this paper to my mentor. And I can assure you that there are probably only 20 words and maybe only one full sentence that resembles what I originally wrote. I can't remember what I originally wrote, but I sure as heck know that it wasn't what I gave him and he never made me feel bad about it and I learned a heck of a lot. So use the occasions to work with someone and simply learn the skills. Publishing misconduct. It's amazing that people are still trying to get away with stuff every year. Every couple of months that I know of at least. We have software that looks for cut and paste examples and people are still cheating. So don't do it even this week. Here's an extreme example. It's always fun to see something and say, well, I'd never do something as much as that. But here's one paper that was published in one journal, 527 procedures, and then tried to publish it in 127. And these are paragraphs from the different journals. You can see this is in one journal, this is in the other submission. Even the figures were identical. The author said, well, I didn't realize. I pulled the figures out of an envelope. I didn't realize they were there before. This was an accident. It didn't really happen. And then eventually it's always the same argument, which is this science is so important it has to be published in multiple journals. And if you don't do it, people will die. And this author actually said that to me. Pretty silly. Don't do it. This is a more important one to realize. As you become proficient authors, and write a lot on the same things, you can't copy the same words that you wrote in another paper because those words are copyright owned by the publisher. You can't use the exact same paragraph as shown here. It's more likely for non-Western authors because they work hard to get that perfect paragraph and then they write more papers in that same area and so they'll naturally fall to the same sentences. Can't do it. Have to write differently. And if you really care about this, there are entire websites and groups of editors uh, and material on publication ethics. And we look at this a lot because it's ongoing. So beware self-plagiarism. It's a real thing. Be careful about pouring authors onto your paper or being pulled into a paper thinking that this is going to advance your career to be the 14th author on a 16 author paper of 10 patients. It won't. Further, you have the risk of being pulled down by someone else's misconduct. In other words, somebody who cheats on their paper and then puts everybody on it to make friends and extend the author list uh, will take everybody down. And if your intent is to grow academically and you have a belief that your hard work will lead somewhere, you don't need to do it on other people's backs. Realize your conflicts of interest, which affect biases and your potential blind spots and overselling something in a device and be candid about it and neutral because if you don't the readers will. This is the point I made earlier we're not interested I'm not interested in seeing the same sentence overall for every single type of paper in one area there are 10 million or 20 million Americans with peripheral arterial disease not the point get to the point get to it faster don't make the reader want to skim your paper. Stick to the point. Better than rambling volumes. I know that many people think that writing a very erudite and extensive review of a topic might make a paper more attractive. It's actually not true. It may be worse because there are word limits on papers and we're not necessarily looking for a review article. So all that beautiful writing that would be great for a book chapter or a different journal than what you're writing may have to disappear. So, trim the fat. I work on paper still. I write, I print, I edit, I revise, I shorten, I print, I edit, I revise, and I do this cycle endlessly 
until I get it to somewhere that I think is ready to submit. And then I'm still surprised when people review my papers blindly and make points that I should have caught. That's just part of it. When you get your comments back, realize that it's an opportunity, but it can be frustrating. When papers used to come back in envelopes, and I'd get this thing back, and I'd be so upset reading all these comments, I think everybody's crazy, I'd throw it into the drawer. And what I learned is to throw it in the drawer for a week and then pull it out and look at it, calm down and say, okay, I can deal with these things. And so you have reviewers who may be assassins, you have reviewers who may make good points that aren't obvious, you may have excellent points, and you have stuff in between. Hopefully the editor has cleaned out the assassin comments. Not always, but you can answer them diplomatically. Be respectful, be detailed, and make it easy for re-review. Let me explain what that means because this is a very important point. This is an example of a revision letter not to write. You copy the point that the reviewers or the editor has written, and then below it you say corrected. And the whole list is just point by point with the word corrected. That's pretty useless because that means that I have to go through the paper and try to find every single point and verify if in fact it was corrected and how. And I can tell you that in papers where that's written, it's very common that things aren't corrected. So that's the, that's the bad revision letter. The good revision letter, the one with the halo over it on the right shoulder, I guess, is the one which quotes the point that's made then provides an explanation of what your thoughts are, and then if you've made changes, you've pasted the actual changes that are in the text into that paragraph. So the editor or the reviewer can see what you thought, your defense if you don't want to make a change, or your agreeing and how you made the change. And then we don't have to scan the entire paper. We trust you more. It makes it easier, and it makes it far, far faster and more likely that your paper is going to move ahead. Make it easy. So, take advantage of suggestions by reviewers. There may be very good ones, even if they're nutty ones as well. You can answer them quietly. Hopefully the editors get it. Even if the reviewer may be mistaken, just answer it. Most of them are really trying to help. They may not be as expertise as you. It's not worth attacking them. And very often it makes your paper better. One obvious thing is making sure that it's the right journal. Getting the coronary stent animal research paper in JVIR, regardless of how well written, is unlikely to play. And yet, we continue to get those because of the word vascular. So, same thing for anything else. This is a JVR word cloud. I run them every so often as well as some other things just for amusement. But make sure that you're writing for the right journal. So in summing up, timely, relevant, evidence-based scientific studies that are well-designed, well-written, and honest are good. Tell people why it's important. Follow directions. Make it easy to read and logical. Get to the point. Take suggestions. Be short. And know who you're writing for. It's a skill. It's painful. It doesn't get any easier. It does get better with practice. It's like Greg LeMond said about bike racing. It doesn't hurt less, you just go faster. You improve with practice. And you want to be a recognized scientist? You'll have to master it. And it can be done. I think I'll stop here with slides and uh, let's see what we have for comments. Uh, have you guys got audio? Yes, we do. Dr. Haspel, thank you so much for all that rich, uh, useful information. Um, it's, it's definitely beyond useful, at least a guide to serve for anybody who's uh, considering publication in a peer-reviewed journal such as yours, and thank you so much for that. I know I'll definitely be looking back on it anytime I decide in the future to uh, pose a publication. And for anybody in the audience, it will be available on YouTube. Again, if you just go to YouTube and you type in IR Education there, it'll pop up right under the SIR RFS Research Lecture Series. And, uh, before, you, uh, before you get into things, if I may interrupt you, I want to emphasize a couple of things. I wrote a very, very brief version of this 
as a short paper in JVIR in the last couple of months. So some of these tips are actually published. And for those of you who may be attending the annual scientific meeting in Vancouver next year in the spring at the SIR, uh, we'll, still be, we'll soon be announcing some small writing seminars for three successive breakfast meetings of about 20 people in which I and at least another uh, JVR editor will be sitting down with a group of 20 or 25 and looking at actual manuscripts. So if any of you are interested in this, keep your eyes open, sign up early, and ideally you send in a draft of a manuscript beforehand, and in that hour session we'll be able to look at it and actually as a group kind of discuss and hopefully you leave with pointers. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Thank you, Rajat. Absolutely, that sounds uh, really excellent and, and quite a privilege. Uh, I, I, I myself hope to attend that myself. Um, but Dr. Haskell, uh, I guess we'll jump right to questions here. We do have a few already. Um, so the first one here we have is, is a little bit of an open-ended one. Um, the question is, my journal submission has just been rejected. Now what? Yeah, it's a great question. So once you get over the, once you get over the pain of the rejection, first realize that there are lots of journals. It may not have been the right home for it. Hopefully the reviews make sense, assuming that you got a full review and not a summary rejection. I'll explain what that means. Take a look at the reasons for rejection and then take a candid look and say, is this fixable? Is it logical? Can I scale it down? Do I need to expand the work? Can I add to it based on the comments? Uh, or was it simply or can I just make some revisions based on the comments and submit it elsewhere? So that's the first question. The second set of questions, uh, and share it with some other people that you trust for some fresh eyes. The second point is what if you get a summary reject or what journals call reject in-house? In other words, it just comes back and it says, no, we didn't like it, we're returning it to you. Uh, that is that should be viewed not as a slap but as a courtesy. It means that a journal is trying to tell you as quickly as possible that for whatever reason it's just not going to fly and they're giving it back to you as soon as possible so that you can take it elsewhere. So it doesn't mean that it's dead, it just means you have another opportunity. So those would be some of the ways to start. I can tell you that for that I've had tons of abstracts rejected by the annual meeting that have turned into papers and vice versa. So it, it, it's not logical, it may not be the right time, but look at it as an opportunity for more work. Okay, excellent, great. Uh, I guess we can all take that with a grain of salt. Um, the next question here we have uh, from the audience is, um, Dr. Haskell, my abstract submission has been rejected from the SIR annual meeting. Should I even bother submitting it as a manuscript to JVIR? If you think it's good work, why not? Remember that an abstract is nothing but air. It's supposed to that's gone, or it's 200 words that disappear. They may not even be citable. The whole currency, hard currency, is a printed publication. The standards and the scrutiny that your work can have in a publication are far more in-depth than they are in an abstract seen by a very small group of reviewers whose judgment at that moment may not reflect the larger judgment of the entire kind of population of published papers. So it really is a different level of review. Uh, some of my earliest most cited papers were rejected for two years in abstracts. I just wrote them and they were published easily. So don't be uh, dissuaded. Keep on going. Okay, great. Uh, so we do have uh, another question here from uh, Lindsay Thornton. The question is, um, I don't have a lot of resources on producing uh, uh, great graphs and figures. Can you please speak more to defective tables or figures, numerical or statistical inconsistencies? What are the most common table slash figure pitfalls to be aware of? Uh, great question. I'm not sure how well I can get into it, but perhaps a few things. Some of the most uh, obvious ones are columns that don't add up, inconsistencies between the numbers that are in the body text or the abstract and the tables. The numbers are different. Maybe the cohort has been trimmed by certain selections, but that's not obvious. Uh, missing 
standard deviations, just reporting means, uh, applying the wrong statistical test for that population. Those are many of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, are sort of the, the top easiest low-hanging fruit. Okay, um, another question we have here is, I, I'm having trouble choosing a topic for a perspective research with my mentor. Uh, can you suggest any utilities that um, are available to me to, to discover where there is a need for particular types of research? Oh my goodness, that's a tough one. Uh, that's that's a thirty thousand foot view, and I'm not sure I can bring anything to bear other than uh, ways to think about your mentoring uh, um, relationship. Which means, if your goal is to conduct a prospective study, which is a long term effort, then that's wholly different than saying. Let's see if we can get a poster or an abstract together. You're in a training program. It would be great to get some experience writing. Those are typically retrospective papers. So those would start by looking at the amount of retrospective material that exists and equally looking at what the strengths are in your local environment. In other words, uh, there's no reason to try to write a kyphoplasty paper if it's infrequently done at your institution. There's no reason trying to write a general radioembolization paper on the local experience when people have published prospective series with uh, 400 patients collected in a database with years of follow-up and stats. So try to look at the areas of strength. If it's your first paper, write small. There's nothing wrong with building up the habit of writing letters and such on interesting things. I'm, I'm not sure how to kind of address questions, whether they're through journal clubs, whether they're through having several mentors, Probably one of the best ways to get your, you know, get your juices going is to attend scientific meetings. Go to scientific sessions where there are few people. Read through all the uh, posters that are possible, and consider going to meetings that have nothing to do with your specialty. Go to the oncology meetings, not the interventional oncology meetings. See what people are talking about, and get your ideas about what you could be doing in IR that nobody else is looking at. Great, uh, definitely a, a very broad question. Um, so we have a question here from Leanne Dumine. Uh, she asks, you touched a bit on this during your talk, but could you discuss more tips on how to properly prepare the paper before even starting the project? Um, so let me try to answer it from a different, couple of different perspectives. Let's say that uh, we're junior authors who haven't written very much beforehand. Uh, we can try to box it into a few scenarios. We're going to write a retrospective review of X. We've done this to patients, and we want to see what happened as a result of that and report our results of some interesting findings. So that's a classic retrospective report of either a surgical or a medical series or something like that. Uh, I would start by looking at other papers that have been published on the topic, not to necessarily kind of pollute my expectations as to what I'm going to do, but to look at the structure of the types of things that they've reported. What are the observations that they've made? What are the tests that they've run? What are the outcomes that they've looked at? And part of that is to understand whether you've got something different, but equally to kind of understand the structure. And the structure of a, of a clinical paper is the same in virtually any similar specialty, be it plastic surgery, ophthalmology, interventional radiology, surgery, or otherwise. So part of it is just looking at, at uh, the types of information that's going to be collected. If I'm doing a retrospective review with someone, uh, I always make the same point, which is we've got to have good data tables, which are kind of like case report forms, that we have poured over before we actually start looking at the medical records because there's nothing more painful than going back and looking at everything again. So making really detailed tables, leaving them alone, coming back to them with fresh eyes, making sure that we think we're capturing everything that we want to and only then starting to collect the data and then usually looking for early signal. So somebody a couple of days ago was saying, was asking me, I want to write a paper on GI 
embolization and look at, res at uh, appropriate use of resources. What do you mean? It says, well, maybe people are ordering too many CT scans or nuke scans on patients when there isn't likelihood that they're going to find something. I said, all right, how are you going to do that? Well, first thing you've got to find out if locally you have enough CT scans on GI bleeding patients, period. And then how many of them are positive? And if you've got enough numbers there, how many of them are negative? And then start, so, that, so first you have enough to work with. Then what do you want to know about them? Will you be able to describe those patients in sufficient detail that you can start to create a hypothesis or build a model? If these six criteria are this way, then the likelihood the CT will show something is this much versus that. And then you, then you start collecting that information. You compare it to other series that describe how ill patients are. And then you have to separate some patients out so you can test your model against them, not throw them all in it. And at each point, there should be a step which says, are we really getting anywhere? Is this moving ahead? Or should we kill this because there just isn't any signal in this? And that's what I kind of view as a series of gates in starting a, in starting a, uh, a, a retrospective review. It's just like a perspective experiment. Make sure that you have points at which you can tell, is this going to make it? Do I need to change? Do I need to drop it or collect new information? I hope that's helpful. Absolutely. Sounds uh, very insightful. Thank you for that uh, response and thank you for that question, Leanne. Uh, we have another question here from Dehi Kim. Uh, my abstract was rejected from the SIR meeting this year without any reviewers' comments. What exactly does this mean? Um, how should I take this as a point to improve uh, for possibly an article submission? Sounds like something we touched on a little bit earlier, but if you could. Yeah, but there are still some points to emphasize. Um, abstracts that are rejected typically have no comments for meetings. It's simply a yes or no event. So uh, you, you take it back to your uh, partners and you say, do we still think that there's a gap that may have been overlooked by whoever that one or two people who looked at it saw? Do we still think we have enough information that had we enough room to write it all uh, would turn into a meaningful contribution? I would not let an abstract rejection dissuade someone from moving to a full publication. Let me say that again. It's worth emphasizing because it's been asked twice. An abstract rejection does not mean that the material in the science is not a good full paper. Equally the reverse. An abstract that accepted, once expanded, once you really see what's under the trunk, may be a terrible paper and may be rejected outright because now that we see your methods, we see that, oh my, it's a complete mess. So don't let the abstract decision sway you one way or the other. Have Just have confidence and get fresh eyes. Great. Uh, thank you for that advice. Uh, thanks for the question, Dehi. We have another question here. Um, Dr. Haskell, you said, do not cite abstracts, but what if there is sparse prior research on your topic and other previous abstracts to support your data? I wouldn't be absolutely dogmatic about it. I would say that uh, this is my preference on abstracts for JVR, which is I tend to not allow citations of abstracts with very rare exceptions, which is large trials uh, on very new areas where it's the only information available and it's going to be another year or two before that trial is going to be fully published. And the reason that I tend not to let abstracts be cited is because it's 200 words and from the abstract to the full paper is 20 miles of open roads and you may have no ability to get to your destination. So, and citing, for example, an abstract of something that was done five years ago and was never published, that's dead air. So I think that it's, it's, it's equally, it's a measure of respect for a published author that they did the entire effort and work and had their paper be, paper be reviewed, that that's something meritorious that you can look at compared to citing something that's only 150 or 200 words. Okay, great. Uh, I hope that helps, uh, Lindsay. Thanks for the question. Uh, next question here is from uh, Marcus Carr. 
how would you how would one highlight the importance of a case report manuscript without using primacy language when the basis of the paper is its primacy? Excellent point. And you'll see that many journals don't have those kind of generally blanket statements that I made, which is avoid stating primacy. So let me step back from it from a couple of ways. First, it's very hard to get case reports published in general in most journals, and that's simply a fact. And some of the reasons are is that journals do care about their impact factors, even though impact factor is kind of a game, frankly. But case reports tend to affect a journal's impact factor, so most editors don't want to publish them, period. So it just makes it a lot harder now than it used to. So that's a starting point. Uh, essentially, what you're trying to do is to explain it in a different way, which is, you know, new, early, I, I don't know. Uh, you can work your way around it. If it truly is the first ever and you want to use first in man or that type of thing or first in woman, then take the shot. If that's what you need to be able to sell it to the editor and the reviewers and tell them why it's hot, maybe it gets you in the door and maybe they'll talk you down off of that to a lower floor, but you're at least in the building. So. No hard and fast rules, but understand that just sort of beating your chest and trying to say this is the first ever, or to our knowledge, more often than not, isn't something. But, it, but if you've got a first, then take the shot. Uh, great. That was a great question, Marcus. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have one question uh, specifically about JVIR. Dr. Haskell, have you considered having a section that features uh, solely resident, fellow, and trainee work uh, to encourage submissions from these trainees? Um, kind of yes and kind of no, because the journal content and quality should not be measured by the experience of the authors, but by the quality of the science. So, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of implied in that sentence that the level and type of work would be different by residents and trainees, and therefore they should have their own section. And the answer is no, not really. You're going to write to the same standard as somebody who's written for 15 years, and your work's going to stand alongside of theirs and be measured by the same ruler. So I'm not sure what identifying it is, other than identifying that it has been presented at, say, a particular meeting or got an award because you're a trainee. Or, uh, or, or some other indicator as a result or a grant or otherwise, but simply to sort of put from the resident section uh, has the risk of, how do I say this without exaggerating, saying that you're, you know, you're exceptional, but not exceptional in the way that you want to be. You want to be measured by the ruler that everyone else does. Uh, now, I'm willing to discuss this. If somebody's got ideas, I'm always looking for ways to do things differently as long as the, the quality of the science is similar. So if, if, uh, if our attendees have new ideas, then please feel free to write them to me or reach out to me when you see me. I'm at haskelljvir at gmail, or you can reach me at jvir at surweb.org. I'm always open to discussing. Great. Uh, thank you for that. And um, Dr. Haskell, just to kind of wrap things up here, uh, we are kind of running over the one hour mark, but uh, last question I want to pose to you, you know, in your in recent editor's message, you had uh, uh, spoken a little bit about moving away from accepting retrospective research towards accepting more prospective research. Is this the, the paradigm in general you would say for radiologic journals or specific to yours and, and should we keep this in mind for our submissions going forward? I think that the early days of uh, interventional radiology and interventional radiology research were to exaggerate you know, the cowboys. Look what we did. This is amazing. Let's quickly write up the paper. Look, we did it in 10 people. Isn't that great? Move on to the next thing. Or look, we did it in 100. Here's what happened. But ultimately, the, you know, we, we, while that is much of what got all of us into this specialty, that video game excitement of doing something amazing or a first or that ability to fix something and make something somebody better, that, that, that thrill is still there. But the long game for us having meaningful impact in medicine, 
and science and research is doing the same type of high-level work that everyone else is writing. And the most cited papers are the ones that are carefully designed. I'll give you an easy example. We look at the first dialysis outcomes quality initiative report that, tried, that created guidelines for, for what should be goals of all treatments in end-stage renal disease patients, and virtually all the early dialysis interventional literature was retrospective reviews. So we had 50 patients. We put, uh, we did balloon angioplasty, and 50% of them were working at X months. Well, how was that paper written? If the patients didn't come back, then the thing must have been working. If they came back, then it wasn't working. Well, pretty obvious that that is a poor way to do a study because non-return of patients, whether they go somewhere else, die, or simply don't get sent back or you didn't check on them, is not a guarantee of good outcome. And yet, the majority of the literature is like that. You start looking through that lens, you can see that a lot of our literature, radiology and IR, suffers from the same things. And when people started to do careful prospective research in dialysis of the same treatments, they found that the patency and durability of therapies was often half as good. So this is really the time. You guys are the new generation to really look at your surgical or medicine colleagues who are spending a year or more in research and learning and honing their research skills in defining prospective studies. It's a lot more front-end work, but the science is more meaningful, it's durable, it's lasting, and it's impactful. So take the time to do it up front. All right, great. Uh, Dr. Haskell, thank you so much. Uh, tonight was really a privilege. Um, for all of the attendees here, and uh, we just can't really thank you enough. Uh, such useful, rich information, and you know, such a great guide to follow for anybody who's viewed. Uh, can't wait to get it up on the YouTube channel. I'm sure it's going to be very popular amongst the RFS community. And uh, just want to say thanks again, and um, hopefully we can do this with you again at some point down the line. Thank you so much, everybody. Any questions? Always reach out. The door is always open. All right, everybody, thanks again for attending. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here. And um, again, uh, Dr. Haskell can be reached at HaskellJVIR if you have any more questions or want to reach out to him with any comments. Uh, thanks again for attending.